So we, we are here at the 84th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is RNA control and regulation. My name is Anke Sparmann. I'm a senior editor at Nature Structural and Molecular Biology, and I'm very pleased to be joined today with, by Dr. Adrian Craner. Thanks for making the time. My pleasure. <coughs> So Adrian holds a St. Gilles Foundation professorship here at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, and he was awarded the 2019 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences together with Dr. Frank Bennett of Ionis Pharmaceuticals for the development of um, antisense oligonucleotide drugs to target gene splicing. So during your presentation here, you already talked about the incredible success story of Spinaza, right. and the first so that's the first approved drug for um, spinal muscular atrophy. So maybe you can start by telling us a little bit more about this devastating disease and the molecular mechanism underlying it, which you discovered. Okay, yeah, sure. So, um, so SMA, or spinal muscular atrophy, is a motor neuron disease. It, uh, it's very severe, and um, so it mainly affects uh, infants and young children. There are uh, milder forms of the disease or delayed onset that affect adults. and. Um, Depending on the type of SMA, it can be uh, lethal and uh, it leads to progressive uh, muscle weakness and paralysis. So it's a pretty serious disease and it's um, uh, inherited as an autosomal recessive a Mendelian kind of disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, so the disease was uh, well characterized and uh, the responsible gene was identified in 1995. And sometime later, it became clear, uh, maybe four years later, that uh, um, the uh, defect in splicing is, is related to the disease. Um, and, uh, and we began to work on that because uh, our interests uh, in my lab have been always on uh, RNA splicing, both the fundamental science and the uh, relationship to disease. Um, yeah, so the, there are two genes that are closely related. Uh, one is uh, missing or is defective in patients, and the other gene functions as a kind of backup. Uh, so it, it can uh, express the correct protein, but in uh, fairly low amounts due to the type of splicing that the transcript undergoes. And so we, we began to characterize that process. We, we weren't the ones who, who mm. described this uh, difference in splicing, but uh, we were interested in that general uh, problem of uh, between the two genes, uh, there's only uh, very few um, nucleotide differences, and, and one in particular had been uh, pointed out in the exon that, uh, that is inefficiently spliced. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we studied that problem. What is it about that nucleotide? You know, what is uh, normally being recognized um, in, in the uh, transcript by various factors? And so we worked on that for a couple of years. And then we began to also think about how to uh, correct the splicing of the SMN2 RNA in order to uh, allow the gene to produce higher levels of protein. And so this drug that was eventually developed, how does it actually work? How does it correct right. the spacing? So it's a kind of drug called an antisense oligonucleotide. And, and so those come in different modalities or flavors, if you will. They can be, so there are synthetic um, short nucleic acids, like a um, single-stranded. Uh, they have chemical modifications. And they can be designed either to um, destroy the target RNA, so they, they will home in on an RNA through base pairing interactions, so they can be very specific. And uh, if the chemistry is designed in such a way that the duplex is recognized by uh, endogenous uh, enzymes, RNA sage type enzymes, mm -hmm. then they destroy the RNA target. In our case, we use a, a different type of uh, oligonucleotide design that um, binds to the RNA target by the same uh, sort of physical chemical interactions, but it doesn't lead to its destruction. Instead, what it does is um, it blocks the binding of RNA binding proteins. Mm. And uh, so if you place an oligonucleotide in the correct place, then you can block the binding of a protein that, that affects splicing in some way. In our case, what we were looking for uh, was to block the binding of a splicing of a repressor. And, mm -hmm. and so then 
the, the axon that's nearby can now be recognized more efficiently by the splicing machinery and then now splicing looks more like it does in the, in the SMN1 gene, mm -hmm. uh, even though we're targeting the SMN2 gene that is still present in patients. So then um, if you deliver the drug uh, to the right uh, cell types and so on, then, then um, um, the cell is now knows how to um, allow this gene to express higher levels of protein. So that, that's sort of the molecular uh, mechanism of action mm -hmm. of the oligonucleotide. So in a way you were involved really from the very early start of just right. figuring out how this works, but then also all the way through to yeah. actually track development. So what were the major challenges throughout uh, that whole process? I think there were many. I mean, this started mm -hmm. as a very <coughs> basic science kind of experiment and, and, uh, or, or um, effort, and uh, we made uh, mechanistic observations that sort of inspired a, a way to try to correct the defect, and we went through uh, maybe two successive modalities for doing that. Um, it, we learned things along the way and mm -hmm. the ultimately successful approach was a bit simpler than the way we had started and uh, importantly we began to collaborate with uh, with Frank Bennett at Ionis Pharmaceuticals in 2004 mm -hmm. and so we uh, we had a lot of discussions and we decided to to use a particular kind of chemistry and to um, um, you know, go with the, the approach that I just described, which is to find oligonucleotides that will block the binding of a mm -hmm. repressor. So we did that very systematically. Uh, there was a postdoc who joined the lab at that time, uh, Yim and Hua, and so he, he did pretty much all the early work, all the preclinical experiments. Uh, we did have a, um, you know, a lot of advice from, from uh, Ionis people mm -hmm. who were doing real pharmacology and um, but initially we were doing biochemistry then cell-based experiments later we set up mouse models and, and so this took quite a number of years yeah. um, so I, I don't know how to say when we started working on this I we can put the start date when I and my trainees began to work on splicing which is much <laughs> earlier on SMA specifically, we began around 2000 or 2001, and um, uh, so this this went on. The screen, as as uh, it ultimately was carried out, began in 2004. The um, spinbrasa, the molecule, well, it had other names earlier, mm -hmm. but we published that in 2008, mm -hmm. and um, so as things were progressing quite well. Um, uh, particularly when we began to do um, mouse model experiments yeah. and seeing uh, pretty dramatic results in terms of splicing and protein and phenotype, most importantly. Uh, then um, so Ionis got quite serious about uh, undertaking the clinical development and, and um, picking among the, the, among the many different oligonucleotides that were effective to look for some th the one that would be most specific and had um, mm -hmm. Uh, minimum um, toxicity at high doses, et cetera. So that's, that's a separate effort in, in pharmacology for which they had a lot of experience and um, obviously that's very important. And then um, the next uh, step was uh, clinical trials and so those were initially sponsored by uh, Ionis um, and about a year later also by Biogen, mm -hmm. uh, uh, teamed up with them. Um, the clinical trials were done in a variety of uh, uh, clinical centers, hospitals uh, in different several countries, and and so they, um, the key trials, phase one through three, took about five years, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, I think it all went uh, pretty smoothly. So it ended up um, uh, taking a year less than than um, had been planned for because um, um, you know the results along the way were very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And so it was possible to, to uh, complete the trial so that the patients uh, uh, still remain, you know, as, as part of the study, you know, a, a, an open phase uh, extension study mm -hmm. beyond the, the original uh, clinical trial. So there are still ongoing clinical trials, but the ones that were key for uh, uh, obtaining the approval of the drug, um, that, that all took about five years. Yeah. So it's probably fair to say that up until not that long ago, thinking of RNA as a drug molecule was, was kind of not really yeah. there. So it was what was pie in the sky. Yeah. 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 So what were the changes that made this possible? Well, I, I think it's all gradual. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think um, 
the, the way we view it is, is that uh, like every new modality, um, there's a concept and then there's the problems and reducing it to practice. I mean, there are always uh, stumbling blocks. I mean, typically delivery of a new type of drug is something that requires a lot of effort. I, I think we were lucky that uh, uh, by the time we started working on this, there was already a lot of uh, uh, several years of experience with antisense oligonucleotide pharmacology. Mm -hmm. They had gone through many chemistries, so there was clinical experience, and not so much with uh, splice modulation, but, mm -hmm. but nevertheless uh, the related chemistries and, and so a lot of that knowledge, uh, I would say you know, maybe more than 20 years of, of accumulated knowledge is what makes these types of things possible. So. Um, when, for example, monoclonal antibodies, I think, went through something similar. Um, you know, th there was a description and one could see right away the potential, but to, to turn those into the drug mm -hmm. took many years. Now, of course, it's, it's much more routine. Yeah. And so now, what are you moving on to? The, I think you also saw, said in your talk you're looking at other diseases to target yeah. these. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, uh, part of the lab still continues to study the basic uh, yeah. fundamental aspects of splicing mechanisms and regulation because I think in what we do, at least the way we approach the problem, we, we're, it's all based on, on uh, insights about the mechanism. In this case, we were targeting a splicing of repressor binding site, but, but why did we, a few years earlier, we didn't even know these molecules existed. Mm -hmm. So one first had to discover that, understand something about how they work. And, and so we continue the basics, but, but we're also pursuing projects where we try to apply um, similar or related approaches, blocking um, splicing components or RNA binding proteins in order to change splicing and also other RNA processing such as nonsense mediated mRNA decay. So we're exploring several uh, potential um, uh, targets that could lead to, to therapeutics for various diseases. So, and what do you think from the basic kind of point of research, what's the next thing that's going to happen in splicing? Oh, yeah. Well, I think that's moving along at, uh, in many different fronts. I, I, you know, when I started in this field, we were just doing cell-free splicing. It was all biochemistry. That's, that's what uh, um, mm -hmm. I started working on the development of systems for that as a graduate student, and there was a lot to do, a lot of biochemistry to identify components, and of course, uh, other labs were using genetic approaches and model <coughs> organisms. Uh, nowadays, there's many more um, disciplines that are kind of contributing to understanding the whole uh, process, uh, uh, quantitative approaches, um, bioinformatics, um, uh, genomics, transcriptomics approaches. A lot of techniques have been invented, you know, since I started in this field. So, so there's always uh, new ways to uh, revisit and approach. There's many powerful cell, bi cell biology approaches as well. Um, but, you know, I think one sees steady progress on many fronts. Uh, every once in a while there's, you know, breakthroughs, so things advance more rapidly. I would say that, you know, structural biology approaches had a, yeah. a tremendous impact in recent <coughs> years with the uh, cryo EM. Mm -hmm. So seeing snapshots of the uh, spliceosome in action it just felt like the field moved forward 10 or 20 years and, and so we, one could appreciate details, some of which were already known, but now you could really see it in real time. It's, it was no longer some kind of uh, indirect demonstration or hypothesis. And so I think there's uh, a lot of work that um, needs to be done using newer approaches like that to, to get new insights. So I, I think there will be a lot of surprises and, and all these things inform also how you might uh, do therapeutics development where, where splicing underlines, uh, underlies the, the overall approach. So there are efforts to develop small molecules. I talked a little bit about that. Uh, it's not so much our work, but uh, developments in the field to also modulate splicing. And so we need to understand better how these molecules are actually doing that. You know, what's the mechanism of action? How specific are they and how um, uh, how applicable that, that uh, approach is to other targets, other splicing events. And structural insights uh, from the spliceosome and so on can, can inform those efforts and vice versa. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so are there any problems with off-target effects of these kind of drugs? Yeah, um, any drug obviously yeah. has that. I, my view is that uh, 
uh, anti-sense oligos because they're based on base pairing. I mean, obviously you have to pick sequences that are not repetitive. So Spinraza in particular um, binds to a sequence that's, that's unique, it's only present in intron 7 of the SMN genes and nowhere else in the mm -hmm. genome, at least as a perfect match. Um, but it doesn't rule out the possibility that uh, imperfect binding with uh, weaker binding, presumably, but with one or more mismatches uh, probably does occur. And, uh, and the question is, um, just because it binds somewhere else doesn't mean that it's going to perturb splicing or some other process, but there is a possibility. So one has to be very careful about uh, uh, looking for um, adverse effects of drugs, mm -hmm. and obviously that's part of the whole uh, clinical drug development. Um, small molecules, it's a completely different mechanism of action, and, and so if we understand better the, the examples, a few examples that we currently know of, and how they're actually doing that, uh, what the changes in splicing, um, they understand a limited number of off-target effects and they appear to be quite specific, but, um, but maybe that can be improved or, or mm -hmm. now if you move to a different target, is it going to be possible to, to have a similar specificity? I think that's something that the field is going to learn in the next uh, short few years, mm -hmm. I think. It sounds like there's a lot of interesting stuff still to come. Absolutely. Thank you very much for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you.